What an incredible show it has been, saving the best for last. He is a general partner with Gumi Ventures, a U.S. $30 million venture capital fund focused on early stage blockchain startups and a venture partner with Bitbull Capital, a cryptocurrency fund of funds. He is also an advisor to Arrington XRP Capital. He has been a keynote speaker at dozens of conferences around the world. He is also co-founder of the crypto exchange Evercoin. He participated in the first wave of the internet as a chief evangelist for the Java language and platform at Sun Microsystems and is now fully engaged in the internet of value. With 25 years of uh, enterprise software marketing experience in Silicon Valley, he has raised over 50 million in venture capital for open source startups such as Gradle, uh, Hazelcast, and has participated in multiple exits, including uh, Inferavo, uh, Web Methods, and DB4O. He is also a LP with Focus Ventures, a firm with over 800 million under management, nine IPOs, and 44 exits. He holds a master's degree in neuroscience from Yale University. Please put your virtual hands together for our final speaker, the man, the myth, the legend, Miko Matsumara. Welcome, my friend, and the virtual stage is all yours. Okay, well, that's that's quite an introduction. Thank you very much. So uh, what I wanted to do today is talk about how to keep yourself safe in this wild west of DeFi. So, you know, what, what do I mean by like, uh, you know, the Wild West? So, you know, I want to kind of first talk about this perspective of like DeFi is uh, dangerous. Uh, it's actually pretty wonderful as well, as you know. So, you know, what I wanted to talk about here is I just wanted to explain that, you know, engaging in these uh, technologies is, you know, obviously has certain, uh, you know, economic safety issues, you know, one of the things that I've been seeing, you know, Andre from uh, Wi-Fi uh, token has these wonderful tweets where he says these great things like this uh, smart contract is purely experimental, you know, don't deploy any any value into it, or this govern this is a governance token, you know, that has no value, please don't, uh, you know, only buy it if you're interested in voting on improvement, you know, proposals. So it, it's, amazing to see this huge, you know, pretty much kind of like a gold rush mentality where things are kind of going very, very fast. Uh, but before I launch in, I actually want to talk a little bit about portfolio construction. And I'm going to be using an example of some of the investments that, uh, you know, I've been making. But before I do that, I want to tell you that, you know, this video is not a substitute for professional investment advice and it is not is for you know entertainment and informational purposes only so you know as a caveat you know don't you know do your own homework and you know this this is really only uh, an example that's used for uh understanding this so what i'm really talking about when i talk about uh portfolio construction is i'm really talking about there's so many layers of engagement the other layer uh other than the financial safety is really talking about essentially cryptography, cryptographic safety, cybersecurity, you know, and personal cybersecurity. You know, I have a whole website dedicated to that called saferbits.org. And if you want to really, you know, get much better cybersecurity, uh, that's very important. Uh, you know, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the technical side of remaining safe. And, and the kind of boundary between the technical and the financial, right? So, you know, as you engage at the layer of smart contracts and at the layer of basically like putting value into those smart contracts, you know, how do you prevent yourself from being liquidated? How do you prevent yourself from being hacked? How do you prevent yourself from any of these potentially negative outcomes, you know, of the funds potentially being drained or losing value? So the, these are important principles. But before I get to some of the technical things, I'd love to talk about just the financial. So um, again, this is not investment advice, but you know, from the perspective of 
someone who is in the uh, role of a professional investor with Gumi Crypto's capital and a, as a venture capitalist. Um, also, uh, the, the investments I will mention uh, are not actually, uh, at the moment, these are not uh, Gumi investments, these are personal investments. Uh, so um, the thing that is important to understand are things like asset allocation. So to me, I think one of the dangerous things I see people doing is uh, applying too much leverage, uh, you know, essentially going into debt, you know, perhaps credit card debt or the worst kind of debt, you know, so over leveraging themselves, right? And really buying more assets that, or putting more assets at risk that they can afford to lose, right? So the idea obviously is play at the scale that is appropriate for you and understand that, you know, all of these are extremely high risk, potentially extremely high reward assets. So, you know, be careful out there. So from a financial perspective, asset allocation is important. So you need to understand, okay, how much should I dedicate towards sort of crypto in general, right? And then the question becomes, how much should I dedicate towards DeFi in general? And then the question becomes, how much of that DeFi allocation should I employ in, in, employ in different strategies, right? So for example, you know, a base portfolio in cryptographic assets would potentially have exposure to capital assets like Bitcoin, you know, and obviously since we're talking DeFi, like Ether, right? And, you know, potentially if you're DeFi oriented, maybe a potentially oversized uh, position in something like Ether, which of course seems to be doing very well lately. Um, so um, the idea then is about then moving to portfolio construction. So now that you have asset allocation taken care of <laughs> and you actually know the size of the bucket, that's appropriate for you, then within that bucket, you need to understand kind of how to engage. Now, there's multiple layers of engagement. So one layer of engagement, obviously, is directly interacting with smart contracts, becoming a liquidity provider, uh, you know, performing some function within a pool, you know, something like uh, balancer pools, you know, uh, obviously you can provide liquidity in a context like Curve, or you can provide liquidity in a context like a Uniswap, right? So the point being that these are all a direct engagement. But what I'm going to talk about at the moment is how do you, for example, accumulate uh, things that are, you know, essentially tokens that represent these projects. So I think, uh, you know, I'm going to mention a few uh, of my picks and talk a little bit about thesis. So, you know, the once you've done your asset allocation and you figured out how much you want to put into cryptographic assets at all, you know, uh, I think because we're in a very uncertain macroeconomic climate, you know, I don't think that someone should be radically overweight in something like cryptographic assets because of the uncertainty, right? So obviously there's other assets like gold, there's other assets like silver, both are doing well, uh, you know, and again, not investment advice, just information and entertainment. Now, obviously the core principles buy low and sell high. So obviously buying assets when they're high priced is a bad idea. So um, the idea then becomes what's the broad thesis within the idea of buying or exposing your portfolio to these emerging DeFi based cryptographic assets. So I think the first principle that I want to apply here is diversification. And the, the main reason why I propose it, and by the way, uh, there, are, there are examples of people that really defy every single principle that I'm espousing, right? So, so there are people, and there are people that are incredibly successful at that. I think they're very lucky, but it's also possible that some of them are very, very smart, right? Uh, obviously, a person who is developing a DeFi protocol has invested and put all their eggs into that basket. And in some cases, those are exceedingly successful and those people are incredibly wealthy. So Peter Thiel says it very accurately when he says that, you know, people who are, uh, who know what to do are the scarcity and those are entrepreneurs. The thing that he characterizes are investors are the people that don't know what to do. And the evidence that they don't know what to do is they diversify, right? So, you know, if you know exactly what's going to work for whatever reason, 
you know, hopefully not some kind of insider information, you know, but if you, if you have extreme conviction on something, you know, that may be warranting uh, oversize or overweight investment. And that becomes closer to uh, venture capital or venture thesis, but even in venture capital, there is quite a lot of diversification. So that's a very normal uh, construct within the world of portfolio construction. And obviously things like valuation, extremely important when you try to understand kind of appropriate mathematics of portfolio construction and risk allocation within a portfolio. So bearing that in mind, then like, you know, what are some of my broader views? So one of my broader views in the DeFi space is that it is a tumultuous space and that the tumultuous space tends to favor in general smaller projects and those smaller projects tend to kind of hyper grow. So that's broadly the thesis, right? So what that means is it means if you have that thesis, then you should expose yourself to smaller uh, projects, but obviously smaller projects and newer projects tend to bear uh, substantially more risk than larger projects, right? But the, the idea behind this thinking is, is for example, if you study the phenomenon of liquidity farming, right? You can do a very simple thought exercise, right? So if you're yield farming on top of something like compound finance, right? You can imagine that, you know, you're trying to get as much of the comp governance token as you possibly can, essentially by doing, you know, some kind of, a, dare I call it something like, you know, decentralized wash trading. I mean, you're, you're basically, you know, um, just trying to maximize your yield of this token, right? The thing that's fascinating is, is that your majority of the economic gains uh, will probably come from the appreciation of the value of the comp governance token than from the kind of intrinsic yield that's produced by the, acti the base activity, right? So that, that just is currently what's happening. Now, I think that's not sustainable. Even Vitalik Buterin has said, you know, hey, these yields and, you know, approaches are not uh, long-term sustainable within DeFi. However, you know, that's kind of what's happening right now. And it's why there is a bit of a wild west including like a gold rush mentality that's going on in the DeFi sector. Um, so the thing that I think is important to think about then is if there's a comparable yield farming instrument that has a very low market capitalization and actually an appropriate tokenomic supply construct, you know, like limited supply, you know, if you look at something like Wi-Fi token, you know, there's a cap limited supply of, you know, 30,000, of these tokens and you know obviously um one of the concerns people had is that you know andre uh could actually potentially pump an infinite number of those tokens in but he obviously used the gnosis uh dis distributed uh protocol to multi-sig that uh key to the contract right so now there's i think nine key holders and so now there's much better governance around the supply Right. So what you need to understand, obviously, are, is the sort of market capitalization, the restriction of the supply, right, and the limits to the supply. These are all kind of constructs of basic token economics, right? So these are these are principles that you should be applying when you analyze the potential future value of any of these assets. Again, not investment advice. So the thing that is important to think about is then if these smaller assets, uh, you know, will potentially have higher growth in your portfolio, then how do you kind of select? So the thing that I also like to think about is subsector diversification. So with subsector diversification, you know, there is this kind of broad like DeFi, uh, you know, segment, right? But within the DeFi segment, there's lots of subsegments, right? So, you know, if you want to kind of analyze it, uh, you know, kind of more from a structural perspective, like for example, you can look at uh, DeFi rate, right? Uh, so DeFi rate.com, I think it's .com. Go to the DeFi rate website. You can basically uh, go ahead and look at uh, all these subsegments. So, you know, really important subsegments like DEX or decentralized exchange, you know, and you see like balancer, these types of things. Uh, you know, you could also see uh, derivatives. Uh, you can see um, very simple things like uh, lending, uh, lending and borrowing, 
Um, there's a whole bunch of these sub-segments and categories, right? So the idea becomes, you know, oracles. So the idea becomes like you, you have to kind of understand in your mind, you know, how to proportion out your um, investable bucket and, and how to proportion them into each of these categories based on your own assumptions about how big each category will be relative to the other category. So for example, uh, now you need to kind of go even to the subcategory and develop a subcategory thesis. So for example, take something like oracles. So, you know, I, I recently had uh, uh, Nick Fett on my show. Uh, it's called the Nico Bits Show. If you want to see the show, you can go to miko.com slash bits. And that's the Nico Bits Show. Um, you can see my show on Teller, uh, which is an Oracle protocol. So, you know, I it's within my uh, small portfolio picks. Uh, you know, I also have a small allocation within band protocol, which is another Oracle. Why do I have these positions when it looks like Chainlink has run away with the show in Oracles? So my thesis in Oracles is very simple, which is the way I look at Oracles is that, uh, you know, Oracles are, the mistakes of uh, around Oracles are huge. Right? That's why I think Oracles are worth investment. And I think that Oracles are very valuable. And we can see that with things like the Black Thursday crash and Maker, you know, we saw that oracles are subject to, uh, you know, attacks. They often are centralization, uh, re represent centralization and, you know, potentially single, quote, in quotes, single points of failure. Obviously, all these systems have some degree of at least distribution, if not decentralization, you know, but if you do attack an oracle successfully, you can cause a lot of havoc and you can actually decrease the value of an entire network. And not only that, but you can also drain contracts. You can do a lot of pretty extraordinary things if you attack an Oracle. So my thesis around this is, is that the Oracle problem is actually a fundamental problem. And what I mean by a fundamental problem is, is that on-chain transactions can be subject to on-chain proofs, which tend to be strong proofs, for example, like a proof of work. Right. So if you look at something like Bitcoin, proof of work allows you to secure the network from false information. Right. And that's all very well covered. Uh, you know, I, th this is sort of a random plug, but, you know, everyone should read uh, Andreas Antonopoulos's book, Mastering Bitcoin, in order to understand kind of consensus and, the, you know, the basic cryptographic primitives of, you know, how um, Bitcoin secures its transaction history, because that's essentially the trick like that's that's what bitcoin does and that's why it's meaningful so my point around oracles is is that uh i if you take some information that's coming from off chain right then all of a sudden you may actually need now a trusted intermediary so it, you know all of a sudden like if you go to the bitcoin white paper and you, you read the second sentence within the abstract it's a, you know the second sentence satoshi wrote in the white paper you know it basically says that the majority of the benefits are lost if you require a trusted third party intermediary that you know and and all of a sudden the thing that happens with an oracle is that you actually do require something to consult right so generally the approaches in the oracle space are you know uh staking and slashing right so the idea basically is well so we assume that people are going to lie Right. So what we do is we punish the people that are that are sort of proven to lie. So the question then becomes, well, who's judging whether someone's lying? Right. And the way that Teller approaches this, uh, which you can see on my show, is it's pretty simple, which is that, you know, it, just like any other thing like like link uh, chain link or, uh, you know, others, the idea basically is, is people stake and they say, hey, I really believe I'm telling the truth and I'm willing to put my money where my mouth is. Right. And so if you have enough of these things, then you can start to kind of like maybe start to trust this distributed network of people that all have similar answers to external things like price. You know, so if you sit on the Ethereum blockchain and ask, what's the price of Bitcoin? You know, ideally you would have multiple answers and you corroborate those answers, right? But what does this mean from uh, exposure perspective? So to me, the thing that's important to understand is, is that um, because there doesn't appear to be a fundamental answer based on physics and, you know, Claude Shannon's information theory about solving, quote unquote, the Oracle's problem, right? I mean, one solution to it is to utterly centralize it, 
right? And if you define something as, uh, you know, the, the sort of essentially the master source of this information, you know, then by definition, you can actually have confidence in it. So it, it, for example, one of the legal definitions of price that's often used in the normal centralized financial industry or C5 is things like the published price of an asset in the Wall Street Journal. Or you will use reference sites like what's happening on Bloomberg or what's happening, you know, in, in the New York Stock Exchange or according to NASDAQ, right? So these are all essentially centralized oracles, right? The thing that makes those uh, utterly reliable is if you actually define the truth as those. But of course, as we know, and it, as Nick mentions in, in this uh, interview, you know, he mentions that sometimes even those can be attacked. Right. But the thing that's funny is if you define that to be the legal truth, then whether it's pumping out a lie or not, legally, that's whatever that saying is absolutely the, the truth. You know, so it, it's it's a mess. So the point being that no, there's no winner take all in oracles, in my opinion. And not only that, but in order to decrease the risk of oracles, you may actually not only want to have multiple oracles that are corroborating, but you may actually want to have multiple Oracle platforms because what, what if one entire platform is being attacked? Like, let's say it's being attacked through uh, DDoS, right? So what's happening now is that there's a delay in things like price information because of a DDoS attack, right? So then you may need multiple platforms, right? So because of this thesis, I believe that these smaller Oracle platforms may be worth a look. And that is why you know, I've taken up small positions in things like TRB and BAND, uh, you know, in order to uh, support this kind of thesis. Um, so, uh, you know, what other subsector thesis uh, points do I have? You know, I also support the idea that a uh, fundamental cross chain is going to be uh, interesting. You know, so uh, there are small uh, opportunities to take positions in things like Rune, uh, things like Kava. You know, Kava is kind of tied to cross-chain around Binance, right? So Binance is a centralized uh, infrastructure and whoever's kind of helping them bridge, you know, the Binance chain token over into the Ethereum world, like will provide some value. And so that, that could be a useful, uh, you know, set of positions. And, you know, Rune, uh, which is Thor chain, that's an interesting uh, technical solution to this cross-chain problem. You know, obviously we're going to see other cross-chain solutions, you know, like Polkadot and Cosmos and others that will uh, start to kind of dig heavily into this uh, domain. So, you know, I think those are uh, also interesting uh, subsection. Um, obviously, uh, the, another one that's kind of interesting are um, just kind of like pocket picks, right? So, you know, I'm happy to throw out some some names here. Uh, again, this is none of this is investment advice. But you know, as far as pocket picks, you know, I like uh, Uma. I'm going to be interviewing uh, Clayton from Uma on my show on the Nico Bits show. Uh, Wi-Fi uh, is kind of a controversial, but uh, you know, it's to me it's extraordinary what's happening there, where a single developer is sort of driving almost like a culture and you know a sort of ultra technical sort of DeFi culture. You know, and really focused on you know, essentially doing things in a extremely fast, disruptive, and technical way. Um, you know, other things that I like: uh, Loopring, uh, you know, BZX. Uh, I had Kyle uh, from BZX on my on the Nico Bits show. It was an interview case. Uh, so you know, these are all um, you know, sort of I would just call them pocket picks. You know, I like uh, Acropolis. That's a good team. You know, so so for me, uh, you know, again, not investment advice. Uh, you know, Meta is interesting. Um, you know, one a super controversial pocket pick would be something like Ampleforth. Uh, you know, um, it's it's so uh, that that was a really interesting. You know, but uh, my friends uh, from uh, Pantera, Joey Krug and Paul, uh, are both you know advising and helping out with that one, and you know that adds a lot of credibility to them. <coughs> so. I would say the following, which is, um, you know, uh, pick your picks and, uh, you know, see, see how it goes, diversify and go for some smaller, uh, you know, potentially uh, high growth opportunities. But remember, if you're doing that, you should 
maintain sufficient diversification. So uh, another thing that I wanted to touch is kind of how to stay safe from a, not from a financial perspective, but a little bit more from a technical perspective. And from that perspective, I'd love to also touch on kind of direct engagement with smart contracts in this space. So, you know, I would say similar to the mechanisms that you use in portfolio construction on the financial safety side, it's important to kind of not put all your eggs in one basket, right? Um, I think there's, uh, this is a wild west. There's tons of new kind of liquidity schemes and constructs. Obviously the first and foremost principle is understand what you're doing. So, you know, really make sure that you have a strong understanding of what you're interacting with. Um, if you're a beginner, you know, please use abstraction tools. Uh, Instadap's a good abstraction tool, uh, you know, things like um, Zapper, uh, you know, so I had, I had, a, um, uh, you know, Zapper on my show, on um, the Miko Bits show, uh, you know, I, I like Zapper quite a bit as far as building a dashboard, you know, and of course things like MetaMask and, you know, the, these kinds of things. Um, just a kind of quick kind of technical tip, um, you know, when you're connecting MetaMask onto, uh, you know, websites, et cetera, I think it's it's important to, you know, be practice a good cybersecurity and, you know, make sure that you're connecting safely. Uh, you know, these are all, I think, big issues uh, and obviously kind of key hygiene. So uh, from my perspective, again, this is this topic is super deep, you know, so I would recommend, you know, going to saferbits.org which is uh, my website, and it's really about personal online cybersecurity. It'll really help you with respect to kind of like main maintaining the highest amount of kind of personal cybersecurity and good hygiene. Um, so don't put all your eggs in one basket in that respect. Uh, you know, the other thing that I think some people would find controversial is you might consider the idea of uh, balancing to some extent CFI and DeFi, right? So um, you know, I, I happen to be an early advisor of the Celsius project. And, you know, I, I do have some, uh, you know, exposure, uh, you know, to that, uh, at, you know, via um, essentially just deposits within, you know, the Celsius uh, insurance contract, you know, but it's not a DeFi contract. It's purely CFI. It's highly centralized. But I'm using that to kind of hedge my exposure into DeFi contracts, you know, like Curve and Balancer and, you know, others. And so um, these are very important to understand. A couple of things to note is um, when you're actually directly engaging in smart contracts, there's a couple of things I think are important to do other than first understand deeply both the technical aspects as well as the economic mechanics of those engagements. You know, I would say that uh, first thing is, uh, I know this is going to sound very curmudgeonly, but age. Right, which is the older a contract is, you know, the more chance it's been battle tested, you know. So I think in, in the reverse of the idea of direct investment into tokens, you know, the idea of, of directly engaging in a smart contract, in a sense, uh, you know, if you're going to do those engagements, those favor potentially uh, larger, older, and more established contract providers, you know. So I think that's very important. Oh, just a quick side note as well. You know, uh, I just want to, there's no, I have no business arrangement whatsoever, but, you know, I do like uh, One Inch Exchange. I think that's a very popular site because it provides meta decks and, you know, pretty much, you know, when you're looking for the types of items that I'm describing, you know, the ability to acquire them is gated by availability. So, you know, if you, if you just search for these, you know, tickers on One Inch Exchange, you know, and you connect your... MetaMask or similar uh, Web3 wallet, you know, you can then directly engage in these kinds of transactions. Obviously, uh, watch your gas fees. Mondays are pretty intense for gas, you know, fees. So, you know, ideally look at kind of uh, save, save, a, save a buck and, you know, do your transactions at some cooler uh, time. Um, these are easy to understand in terms of the, the, the congestion is pretty easy to understand if you just kind of like look at blockchain analytics. So uh, the other thing to kind of note with respect to direct engagement into contracts is, you know, uh, you also kind of want to understand things like uh, smart contract audit, right? So the question is, you know, whether uh, reputable firms, obviously like 
uh, Zeppelin, uh, Trail of Bits, uh, you know, Least Authority, uh, Quant Stamp. Uh, I, you know, I interviewed Casper uh, Bach from Quant Stamp, uh, not actually about DeFi smart contract audit, actually about his audit of the uh, recently launched Ethereum uh, 2.0 testnet. So that's that was exciting. That's an exciting moment for Ethereum. I'm not like a huge Ethereum 2.0 uh, zealot because I actually think scalability is going to actually come from more like the Reddit contest that will be mostly, I think, layer two style scalability. But I think scalability is coming to Ethereum and it's coming not that far future. There's some really great uh, projects that uh, I think are listed there as part of that Reddit uh, you know, contest. So uh, big, big, big fan of that, very excited. Um, there are some really important things to also understand. Uh, you know, make sure you understand the rules of liquidation. So when you engage in contracts, you know, make sure that you don't somehow get liquidated. And the thing that you need to really understand things are kind of how leveraged you are, you know, and how exposed you are, right? Because the thing that is important to consider are scenarios where, you know, the fundamental price of Ethereum kind of gets, uh, you know, knocked down or, you know, so some of these fundamentals, if you look at that, you know, it's kind of maybe it's unimaginable, but if you think about um, you know what happens in standard financial markets is whenever you see um, people gaining uh, too much alpha, right, from from applying a very linear set of strategies, you know, then someone will come along and really try to wreck that, right? So uh, an example of this is in the standard financial markets, the behavior of something like Tesla stock. Right, which is that what happens when all these crazy bulls kind of try to buy lots of Tesla stock is that you know people try to build short interest, right? So the short holders are actually really trying to mess with the bulls, right? But obviously the thing that happens when too much short interest piles up is that you know some major actor comes in and just buys a ton of Tesla stock and just blasts through all the shorts, and the shorts basically get liquidated, right? They get they get punished, right? So the thing that's important to understand is, is that, you know, uh, this is a, a bit like an avalanche. So I talk about that as well, which is, you know, I talk about this in a sub show on GoBits called DeFi is going to collapse, right? So like an avalanche, when too much snow piles up, you know, eventually it's going to collapse, right? And so similarly, when too many shorts pile up, basically what I suspect is happening is, is that, you know, Elon Musk has a lot of friends who are multi-billionaires, uh, you know, and uh, including Kanye, you know, and and Elon calls his friends, you know, and, and he's basically like, you know, and these are the types of folks who hang out with Elon Musk and basically are like, you know, Elon, let's let's go to Mars, right? Like here, here, take, take, take this money, put it in SpaceX, we're gonna go to Mars, you know. So it's definitely a very unusual group of people. But the idea is if someone like that can actually blow through all the short holders, then the short holders all get liquidated, right? So my point being not that DeFi has that kind of level of centralization of ownership, but there are still super whales, right? So be beware, right? So what can happen is a super whale could potentially liquidate a huge stack of ETH just for the sole purpose of like benefiting from this chaos, the resulting kind of chaos that's produced by that, right? So my point is, be careful out there, you know, and make sure that you've got, uh, you know, backup plans. So in terms of technical black backup plans, a couple of uh, things that are interesting are um, Nexus Mutual, which is obviously a way of insuring activity on the blockchain. So, you know, it's an insurance provider. That's one uh, semi-technical approach. You know, another concept is uh, called DeFi Saver. It's a, strangely has two A's, S-A-A-V-E-R, DeFi Saver. And, you know, that's using things like, you know, Aave, uh, flash loans, you know, flash lending, things like that to kind of handle corner cases and potentially protect assets from liquidation. So there, there's some very neat kind of emergent solutions, you know, that enable you to establish kind of more defensible positions, you know, and, and not over leverage. So, you know, I, I think from, from my side, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, that's, that's, those are some of the technical uh, solutions that, that I have in mind. Uh, hello, uh, you're, you're live. Uh, Just a quick uh, question. Yes, what is the, absolutely. what is your website for the security? Oh, oh, uh, it's saferbits.org. So it's S-A-F-E-R, safer, 
bits, B-I-T-S dot org. And, uh, you know, that's a not a specifically a DeFi site. It's much more general purpose, uh, you know, cryptographic cybersecurity uh, gives you lots of tips about securing uh, email, two-factor authentication, how to secure using hardware-based encryption, using things like YubiKey, uh, LastPass, and Bitwarden, and you know, all, all this kind of how to build up a really good personal cybersecurity kind of hygiene. So, okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, I, I think that, that pretty much concludes uh, my my presentation. So, you know, I'm happy to. Thank you. Jump on here, and uh, you know, thanks, thanks for uh, you know uh, giving me a time. Thank you. Okay. Bye.